and we're going to have Dr. Heberly start her presentation, and she's going to be talking to us this afternoon about reading rights in prison. So we're very fortunate to have Dr. Heberly, who is a wonderful person and does a lot of things on campus. I guess I'll just let you talk, Dr. Heberly. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And I'm so impressed with the work that you all have done to pull this off this year. And if I keep looking up over my shoulder, it's because we have a couple of big screens on. So Paulette's on the big screen right now in my classroom. <laughs> I am in a classroom because we start class at 2.30 and I'm also fortunate to have three students in here with me who came a little early to listen and to participate. So. Um, that's my situation and that's why I'm sitting here in a mask uh, because I am in the classroom. So um, I'm going to present today and again thank you very much for everyone that makes this possible each year. I am going to share my screen I hope and show you um, offer you a PowerPoint that uh, will be some text and some lists and some ideas and uh, about accessing the right to read in prison. So those are my identifying characteristics here on campus with my email. And if you're interested in uh, having a copy of the resources that are in the PowerPoint, please just email me. Um, Paulette knows how to get in touch with me, all the organizers do. If you would like a copy of the PowerPoint, um, I'd be more than happy to send it on to you. So I put right to read in prison because it is uh, not assured um, once you are convicted of a felony and sent to a state prison or a federal prison. You typically are stripped of rights. We have a phrase that we use to describe that as being civilly dead. Your civil rights, your civil liberties are then very much restricted. That doesn't mean that you don't have any rights at all and so many much prisoner rights litigation has gone through our courts over the last century. And in one of those pieces of litigation, Thurgood Marshall, who we should all remember in these days of, um, of uh, turmoil on the Supreme Court, Thurgood Mar Marshall said in Procunier versus Martinez in 1974, when the prison gates slam behind an inmate, he does not lose his human quality. His mind does not become closed to ideas. His intellect does not cease to feed on a free and open interchange of opinions. His yearning for self-respect does not end, nor is his quest for self-realization concluded. If anything, the needs for identity and self-respect are more compelling in the dehumanizing prison environment. Another quotation that I use as an epigraph for this is from Penn America. Uh, this is an organization that defends the right to read and write and also has a massive history and a very important history in the context of soliciting and making possible prison writings and making them available to the public. And from a report that I refer to in this talk and have referenced at the end of the talk, they say, with over two million Americans incarcerated, the book restriction regulations within the United States carceral system represent the largest book ban policy in the United States. Now that is in aggregate. And what I'll be doing is disaggregating some of these issues because as you know, we have, a 50, we have 50 different state prison systems and a federal system. And then we have jails and we have detention centers. And so the kinds of policies that are in place in all of those places tend to shift and change across time and space. So this is a kind of 101 on how people who are incarcerated get access to written materials. People who are incarcerated can purchase private subscriptions and these will be surveilled in the mailroom and, and governed by statewide lists. That's not me, is it? And, uh, sorry, prison libraries exist in most prisons controlled by statewide prison policy and the discretion of particular prison staff. There are educational programs of the kind we have at the University of Toledo called the Inside Out Prison Exchange Programs and the controls then are also the same as in the libraries in the prison for the most part. There are book donation drives and we'll be talking about that more later. 
all because, because all written material, and, and these are controlled because all written material is assumed to be a vehicle for contraband into the prison. Donations can often only be made through certain vendors, and many systems have attempted to ban all used books coming in, making it quite cost prohibitive for non-profits or just ordinary people to send books into prisons. Uh, people who are incarcerated can make private orders. Uh, Amazon is one of the largest vendors that is allowed to send uh, books into prisons. And uh, if you go to some websites now, and I find this extremely problematic, Amazon is sort of the vendor. So it's become quite a boon for Amazon to have, um, to be one of the only approved vendors for prison book drives. We shouldn't ever forget that there is always within the context of the carceral institution, the passing around of written literature. I think of it as a kind of underground railroad for literature inside prisons. Um, some of our students sometimes would try to get their friends inside to take an interest by simply leaving a book that they'd been reading on a table in the day room and waiting to see who goes over and looks at it and picks it up and then going have a conversation with them. Part of my goal as an educator is just to get as many books inside as possible because we often have more leeway to bring things in as educational texts. And so I just try to bring as many in as I can as an educator and then they get distributed through this kind of underground railroad. And also there is now, of course, in the digital aid electronic devices, not connected to the internet, but to a private company called JPay that facilitates digital educational opportunities. So some, those are some of the ways in which incarcerated persons can get access to written materials. So how are decisions made in these systems about who gets access, who can do what with uh, written materials inside prisons? Among those of us who do educative work or really any kind of volunteer work, a common theme is that whether a policy is in effect or not on any given day, sometimes it depends on who's working the desk, uh, whether that be the sort of uh, dress code that is in force or what kind of materials someone lets in. So there's just a lot of uh, differences among staff people um, which is not, uh, you know, they don't go way out of line or anything, but it can just be very flexible, we'll say. Uh, decision making and policy making in prisons is somewhat random, therefore. So those making decisions are often folks with very limited prior or off the job training. So prison by prison decisions uh, about written materials reflect the everyday biases and fears we all may have about those who live in prisons and may reflect some uh, lack of awareness of what of the context. Um, for example, when I was teaching the Massachusetts prisons, I had a colleague who wanted to bring in a book by Andrea Dworkin that was titled Pornography, and they would not let them bring that book in because they couldn't distinguish between being about pornography and being pornography. And of course, Andrea Dworkin is one of the, the world famous anti-pornography activists from who, uh, and, and yet I was able to bring in a book called Wretched of the Earth, which is by Frantz Fanon, which is an argument for violent revolution against colonizers. So go figure. Um, so there's sort of the everyday kinds of awareness of the people making the decisions may mean that some books get in and some books don't on very odd, for very odd reasons. State legislatures have, uh, have occasionally weighed in on what and how written materials get into prisons. However, for the most part, they leave it to the state prison system and its administrators to figure out. Uh, politicians and the courts these days have left a lot to those who run prisons in terms of decision making. So common reasons for prohibition. Uh, so what I do is I list the reasons and then I give an example of a book that probably sh we would not want to have uh, restricted in a prison and then sort of how that gets extended ended to other larger general categories. So if it has any sexual content, nudity or obscenity, well, on the face of it, that sounds right, but that means that The Color Purple by Alice Walker can't get it, might not get inside a prison, and almost anything by a feminist that refers to sexual violence or sex in general. Depictions of violence or language perceived to encourage it. So that might be my infamous life, an autobiography of Mob Deep's Prodigy, which is a kind of redemption tale by John Prodigy Johnson and really almost anything written by black men about life on the street. So a third one is uh, depictions of criminal activity or language perceived to encourage it. So almost any detective novel would be subject to restriction. Depictions of escape or language perceived to encourage it. So any book with maps. And there was 
even a case with a map where the map of the moon uh, generated a uh, restriction on a text coming into prisons, any kind of map. Um, an encouragement of group disruption or anti-authority attitudes or actions. So the new Jim Crow, mass incarceration, the age of colorblindness infamously has been banned by many states at different times. And then of course the general category would be almost anything critical of race relations or law enforcement. So the final one would be racial animus or language perceived to encourage hatred. So Race Matters by Cornell West has been banned and anything by Frantz Fanon, except if an educator like me brings it in, or other critical race theorists might be banned. And again, these are all mites. These are not on, you know, these might be on some lists, these, but these are the kinds of texts that have made it into the press and the media when prison systems have attempted to restrict them. So each state has a director of prisons. Uh, they are typically appointed by the governor, which means that policy often changes with changes in executive leadership. So even without this change at the top, prison policies, not unlike the educational policies, is constantly changing and shifting as administrators attempt the impossible task of caging thousands of persons in miserable and underfunded conditions. So what does that mean? It means the policy about censorship of materials is hardly at the top of their priority list. For all who work in prison, the less that comes in that is outside of absolute prison control, the better. It takes a lot of staff time to review each piece of mail, to flip through the books for contraband, to check the content, and to decide whether something will be prohibited. So sometimes materials will simply get tossed into the trash because there's ambiguity, and staff will typically err on the side of security. So the statewide system will make policy, but wardens also have enormous discretion to decide what materials will come in. And each prison will be somewhat different depending on its security level and attitudes of those who work there. The staff at each, any given prison also has an enormous discretion. When an incarcerated person takes a class, a book or an article may be allowed in for educational purposes, but, and I've had this experience with my students inside, an officer when tossing a cell may confiscate a book on security grounds and the incarcerated person will have few avenues by which to reclaim their their property. So I just wanted to give you a, a, a really good example of some of the carelessness in terms of policy making on the part of statewide prison systems. And here the Seattle Times reported that the Washington State prisons instituted a ban on used books coming into prison. So, you know, usually policies like this and laws are in response to some kind of problem that the uh, staff of the prisons have brought, brought to the attention of the director. So this particular policy, banning used books, was based on the problem of contraband being smuggled in through the pages of books. 17 incidents were found to be driving this concern. And so you have to listen, care listen and read carefully to see how this worked. 17 incidents were found to be driving this concern that the policy would impact 17,000 individuals in the Washington state prison system. Of those 17 incidences, which were identified using prison date of incident reports, so the staff person fills out an incident report, they put it on file, somebody goes through them all, finds these 17 incidents, and makes a policy banning these books. So there's something written on the page, and it says, and the Seattle Times reported that three were not indeed about, of those 17 incident reports, were not indeed about books carrying contraband, but about incidences reported by Officer Booker. And so the data collection process of the incidences identified Officer Booker as being about a book that had an incident attached to it carrying contraband. Or it was about somebody, someone doing something while being booked. And it was about a report that someone found a shank on a bookshelf. And so the means by which they assessed the data to try to, dis to find the problem that they were solving by banning used books was indeed quite careless and flawed. So while those who administer and work in prisons bristle at intervention, they also respond to it, as shown in the stories of the ban of the uh, New Jim Crow, Michelle Alexander's book in New Jersey, and the rescission of many hastily formulated policies across the states, like the one in Washington state. However, reactive public policy, reactive public pressure, I say reactive public pressure is never enough because it's really hard to know what happens inside prisons and difficult to raise consciousness broadly enough to raise a stink when we do learn. 
the courts are almost useless. The Supreme Court in Turner versus Safley Saf in 1988 basically conceded the prerogative of prison administrators as the experts on security, which includes restrictions on books. In Ohio, the governor appoints the director of the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Correction, so it is difficult to engage her or them on any consistent basis because, of course, they change with the leadership in the governor's office. So I'm going to leave with a few questions. One is, um, what is the point of reading in prison, right? Um, and part of the ar arguments that we make about having more open policies rather than um, limited policies is to ask the question, is it radicalizing to read or is it redemptive? And of course, I would argue that it's both and that both things are probably good. The tension surrounding content-based censorship is as much about how prison officials measure or assess the security implications of content. Authoritarian systems will always fear subjects who learn to read and write independently and thus think independently. And prisons are authoritarian systems. They exist, however, within a constitutional republic. We consent to the presence of these many authoritarian systems and therefore, we must take responsibility for what happens inside in the name of our security. So when I'm thinking about this, my conclusions, um, if we're to change our prisons, and uh, most people these days think that they need to change no matter where you are in the political spectrum, we must know what people who are incarcerated have to say about the conditions in which they are held from the most normal prisons, which create their own special forms of misery for those incarcerated, to the most obviously brutal prisons. Part of the reason I teach classes in prison is that I wish to make it more likely that those incarcerated will find their voices, develop an analysis of their situation that is not just about their individual failings or choices, and gain the confidence to express themselves publicly, not only about prison conditions, but about whatever it is they find to be important. This can only be done, this is done in part by reading. A few years ago, I presented here at Banned Books about why we should read what those who are incarcerated write. But writing comes with reading. These facts and policies and ideas I've shared today is the flip side of that presentation. I argue we must make it possible for those who are incarcerated to read widely. It literally, literally makes all the difference in the world within the prison environment and to us as citizens. Most people in prison have had little to no access to formal education prior to being sentenced to prison. Many are autodidacts, doing their best, and some doing very well with the limited resources available to self-educate. But free speech is not so meaningful if one feels one should not or is not able to speak for lack of language, education, and access to different perspectives. Reading, as we know, enlarges one's perspective and offers the vocabulary to express oneself. Encased in cages or barracks side by side with only one another and the staff to engage with on a daily basis, reading becomes not just an escape, which is good, but a necessary means by which thinking beyond the immediate circumstances can happen. This helps with re-entering a world that has changed radically since they went in. But it also helps improve the culture inside prisons by keeping minds alive and engaged beyond the misery being imposed by the structures and systems of mass incarceration. So getting books into prison will not end mass incarceration. And I struggle with, and I feel very ambivalent about helping prisons appear to be doing a better job. Further, staff consider educational volunteers as helping to keep the peace by keeping the incarcerated population busy. They call it keeping the priz biz. And I that, heard that phrase ever since I started teaching in prisons in the 1990s. But as long as fellow citizens, incarcerated citizens, and those who are being held in detention who are not citizens are being caged, we must offer some means by which they can still have a life of, a mind, of the mind. It's an obligation that is articulated by Thurgood Marshall. It will, no matter what the conditions in prison, continue to make some kind of difference, even while we work to re reduce our reliance on law enforcement in prisons to resolve political and socioeconomic issues that our current system is either ignoring or allowing to fester. So these last few slides are some nonprofit organizations and websites taking donations if you're interested in doing that. There's no organization that I could find that is specific to Northwest Ohio that is supplying books to prisons or jails, but there may be one. 
but if anyone would like something to do, that would be an awesome project. Uh, one of these is an article, this here is an article about a high school student in Stark County, Ohio, who founded an uh, organization that's very successful to getting books into the local jail where he lives. And these are the statements and reports regarding the policy, some of which I drew on in order to put together this presentation. And these are just a few media resources, and I know you can't copy all this down right now, but I'd, like I said, I'd be happy to send this to anyone who asks. These are just some of the media coverage of some of the bands, some of the efforts that have been made, which I covered very briefly in the very beginning of my talk. And that appears to be the end of my discussion. So Thank I don't you, know if you have questions or not, because I don't know what time it is. We are delighted to have you and some students with us from your class. This is great. So, are there any questions for Dr. Heberly? Any questions for her? I don't have a question, but more just a comment. Your talk got me thinking about the politics of titles. Uh, and you know how like when somebody's just, you know, you're talking about the people who are supposed to, um, choose whether or not these books go into the prison, just merely looking at a title, it, for some of them will dictate whether or not prisoners get access to these books. And it was interesting because uh, the other day I, I have a book and the title is Talking White Trash. And the book, one of my friends recommended it on Facebook and it actually got banned. The, the title got banned on Facebook because it had the words white trash, hmm. which the point is to obviously not promote it, but rather to counter it. But it just made me think about, you know, the censorship that that emerges from just a title in and of itself. And so I don't know. It just it. You're, I really enjoyed your talk, and it, it got me. I mean, I, I I didn't know about this. So thank you for sharing what you did. I just made me think a lot about the politics of titles and how maybe we just need to be very neutral. I'm not sure, but <laughs> just a, quite a dilemma. So thank you for sharing that. Well, maybe what we have to do is put a colon after white trash saying, this book discusses white trash critically. It does not promote the... <laughs> maybe, maybe. We have to, maybe we have to write the book on the title page and then it'll be clear. I don't know. I don't want to change any titles, that's for sure. I know, but yeah, you're right. I mean, do we have to just it's like the book on pornography, right? I mean, couldn't Andrea Dorkin name it something else for heaven's sakes? Exactly, exactly. That's exactly what got me thinking about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. That's a really... Good point. And so when you have an overworked and understaffed and, and undereducated staff working on this, then you're just not going to get good results um, yeah. in terms of the kinds of decisions being made. Yeah. It's a problem that we see often in these challenges and banning. A bunch of people will get all upset and they haven't even read it. None of them have read it. So they don't even know what they're talking about, and yet they want to deny others the right to read it. You can't tell by the title really what anything's about. To look inside. Thank you, Tasha, for the comment. Do we have some more questions for Dr. Heberly? Oh. Nothing on social media, not yeah. yet. That's it. Oh, for heaven's sakes, politicians, go away. <laughs> I have to have my phone and my email in case presenters contact me with issues about getting into the Zoom room. Any but questions? sometimes Maybe the noise. You're asking, I'm putting my students here on the spot to see if they have any questions. Yes. Yes, thank you that. so much. <laughs> we do really always appreciate. I had a question for you, though. Yes, ma'am. Is there any kind of book in particular that incarcerated people want more than others? No, um, I think that they want to read just like any any of us want to read fiction, uh, mystery. Uh, intellectual books. One of the things we did through the Inside Out Prison Exchange Project is do a book drive for the library at the Toledo Correctional Institution has not always been particularly well managed. 
And also people will use books as contraband. I mean, that's not a, that, that's not a myth. That's actually true. People do. And, and people will keep books because they won't return them. And so libraries sort of churn through books a lot. And it's very difficult to manage a prison library in general for all kinds of reasons. So what we did was create a, a particular library for uh, the people for inside, the Inside Out Prison Exchange Project, where anybody that's taking a class or is taking a workshop with us has access to it and can check out books and it'd be a little bit more under control than the prison library itself by the inside people themselves. By the inside students actually kind of kept track of who had the books out and who was taking them. And we found that that worked a lot better because when they held each other accountable for the books coming back to that particular library and what we just had a huge filing cabinet full of books that were donated and they were all what we wanted our goal was to have books of the kind of books that um that young people will be reading in their first few years of college and so we took donations from you know textbooks and also fiction and a lot of uh but but it, but um at the again the kinds of books you'd be reading in a liberal arts classroom or in a college classroom so, um, so that that has worked really well. And uh, when we when we went to maximum security, it became a little bit harder for the men inside to access it and to actually control the terms on which the books were uh, taken and 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 given back. Uh, but we found that putting the people inside in charge of the of the lending it worked really well to do that. And so I can't really say that there's any particular kind of book because in my experience. I mean, I had a student in Massachusetts who is an expert in classics, and he drew a, um, he painted a, a, a genealogy of the Greek gods on his cell wall that a scholar from the classics department at the University of Amherst came and took a picture of and used to educate his students. So people do remarkable things if they get access to things inside uh, prisons, and that's a, sort of an outstanding example, but you find all kinds of different levels of the use of intellectual and and just fun materials as well. I mean, so. Well, I think too, if you can set up some kind of a way where they're checking books in and out, it's more like something normal. Mm -hmm. well, the library does that, but people don't return them and it's hard to enforce. Yeah, I bet. And, and, guard, and correctional officers will take them. And so it's, prisons are messy places, I tell you, to try to keep anything for all kinds of reasons. Well, does anybody else have a question or a comment here? Liam? Um, Liam has a question from the classroom. If most of the books coming to the prisons are being exchanged, are you kind of these classes in the prison, like volunteers coming in? How does something like COVID and there not being volunteers in classes in prison impact like the flow of books into a prison? That's a good question how COVID has impacted this. Um, COVID has impacted prisons by shutting down all visitation and all volunteer programs. And so right now there is very little passing across the prison walls in the shape of anything, never mind books. Um, so we have a lot to do, a lot of work to do to build back up both the inside out and educational programs um, once the pandemic is passed. In fact, I got an email literally one minute before we started this, that we're gonna be able to start our uh, programs up again inside Toledo Correctional but we can only have five people in a room at the same time. So we have to split that between inside participants and outside participants, and it's just gonna be complicated, but at least the flow can start again, and we're gonna to try to keep our momentum going. So that's an exciting thing. That was an exciting piece of news, and we'll bring as many books in as possible, because that's my goal, is to always bring as much written material in as I can. So Thank you, everyone. I have to start my class because they're all sitting here yes. wondering why we're talking about prisons and books. Well, thank of, you, Dr. Hemerly. Right. Thank, thank you all. We appreciate it. Anybody wanting, okay, you, you are going to your class. We really appreciated it. And thank you so much for participating this year. Thank you so much for inviting me. And again, um, if you would like, please just email me. I can send you the PowerPoint with all those resources and ideas. Um, Thank you very much, and I'm going to sign off. Goodbye. Bye now.